Um, so Tim mentioned my background. Um, I'm an analyst at heart. And so the, the key thread across that, um, you know, different couple of, of experiences I've had is that I like to analyze problems, I like to overanalyze problems. And I like to question what keeps us up at night. And so the keynote yesterday, Mark discussed something that keeps him up at night. And that is the potential for an OT cyber incident to happen in his information network and for him to not know it, right? For him to have um, some, some zero day component, you know, active in his network that he can't identify. Um, I am gonna spend this whole talk not giving a vendor pitch, even though we do have a great technology solution that was mentioned. But I'm going to have you question what it is that keeps you up at night. And so, like many people in the OTICS cybersecurity community, we like to have four jobs that we don't get paid for. So this report is something that I published with the um, Atlantic Council on April 19th. You can go and download it. It's a free PDF. I think it's like 10 or 15 pages. And it really does discuss a lot of the issues with how difficult it is to assess um, purpose-built systems and how cybersecurity and cyber incidents introduce randomness into deterministic systems. And we're talking deterministic from a physics perspective, of course. Um, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a data scientist. Again, I'm just a, a problem analyst. And so I will spend some time uh, telling some stories. And I joked on Twitter that I would include this principle in my talk. And so when I did get started in nuclear weapons analysis, um, we were looking at cybersecurity vulnerabilities to nuclear weapons command and control, NC3. And when we started to do scenario analysis, it got like really Hollywood really fast, right? Because we've all seen war games. We've all seen the kind of, uh, you know, next level cascading impacts. Everything goes wrong all at once. And um, people really enjoy those scenarios, right? So again, I want to have you question what keeps you up at night. And so um, a nuclear example is a number of years ago, somebody wrote a New York Times article and they were arguing that, and this person has since passed away, he was a scholar in the nuclear field, and he argued that a terrorist could hack into nuclear weapons command and control and launch a nuclear weapon. Horrific, right? Like a horrible incident if you wanted to dream that up. Likely, not really, right? Based on what we know about how nuclear weapons are air-gapped, how we spend a lot of money and due diligence on the supply chain, not the like, it's the most sexy, but like least plausible scenario. A much more plausible scenario is to look at the Minuteman silos in a state like Wyoming. And even though they don't tell you what they spend the modernization on, Congress tells you how much money they're spending on modernization for the nuclear fleet. And then if you do some really weird research like me on the procurement website uh, that the government puts out, you could actually go back and map who might have gotten the predictive maintenance contracts for the Minuteman silos across uh, the Western United States. Again, a distributed denial of service attack on a Minuteman silo, not a super sexy terrorist launching a nuclear weapon type of incident, but a little bit more plausible. So when we think about planning for scenarios, I want all of you to question what keeps you up at night and question the scenario planning. So I grew up in theater. I have four older brothers, so I needed more attention. And there's this thing in writing, um, if you're a writer, called Chekhov's gun. It says, if you say in the first chapter that there's a rifle hanging on the wall, in the second or third chapter, it absolutely must go off. If it's not going to be fired, it shouldn't be hanging there. And so you've heard a couple of talks this week or these last two days that have said, tell me how. How is that going to map to my environment? What is the context? How is that gun going to go off in my system? If somebody tells you that there's a risk or a threat on slide one, tell me how it's going to impact me and my process by slide three or get out. Like, Start to question those scenarios that you do. I've got a couple other stories and then I'll get into this methodology that I promised you all. So I moved from nuclear, I go to Stanford and they want me to look at accumulation risk for cyber insurance. And again, they have these Hollywood scenarios, the whole electric grid's gonna go down as if there's just one. And I did some analysis and they asked me to use my nuclear background to look at the financial impacts of fallout analysis if we knew that a nuke would take out New York. The Department of Labor has put out this research and you can go and look and say, okay, well, if the stock exchange goes down, here are the cascading impacts for finance. And cyber folks wanted us to plug and pull that data into accumulation risk for cyber scenarios. Good formulas, bad data, very bad data. I said, you know what? If it were me and I were this big bad threat actor and I wanted to take down anything, I would look at a Charles Schwab portfolio and I would find some common denominator across that portfolio that would lead to a catastrophic risk based on a single point of failure that would cause kind of like a 2008 scenario. We actually just saw this, it wasn't a cyber incident, but the Silicon Valley Bank example is that common denominator of risk that becomes a single point of failure 
And so if it were me, for accumulation risk, I would look at those single point of failures across big financial portfolios and take down your portfolio for those compounding threats rather than sector specific or vertical specific. Very difficult to, to wrap your head around, but again, ignore the Hollywood scenarios and think about what really could happen and how that might happen. A couple other ones, I did a tabletop for a city and the city leaders really wanted to talk about somebody hacking into the um, stoplights, turning all the stoplights green. At the same time, all the cars collide, ambulances can't get in, people are bleeding, there's a missing arm. Again, don't make fun of these people. These are horrible scenarios. I would never want to live in that reality, right? But we have some people that know logic and programming, and they actually came in and described to the folks, that's really not very likely given the logic and how you program these systems. And once they realized that, I said, hey, who, who owns your parking meters? And they said, what? And I said, who owns the infrastructure for your parking meters? And they're like, oh, we, uh, we put that as a third party, right? We outsource that. And I said, Let's talk about a scenario in which I infiltrate your parking meters that ride on your city infrastructure to get into your Wi-Fi to do this, 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 and this. And that became the scenario that we actually went forward with for their tabletop. Um, I was in a, I wrote a ransomware hospital simulation, and I had somebody, thankfully not a doctor, ask me, why would it be important for a surgeon to have patient history if the surgeon knows how to perform the emergency surgery? And I said, maybe in combat or in a you know, really horrible situation, again, a realistic situation that could happen, that might be an important question. I said, but for a hospital that wants to maintain malpractice insurance, it's an important question, right? You have to have your, your medical background. Um, last one, airports, my absolute favorite. You do scenario planning with airports. A couple of years ago, like everyone was obsessed with drones. Like there was a transponder on a drone, a drone was gonna bring down a fleet. There's a lot of ways you could ground airplanes, but the drones were like the favorite one. Same thing, I came into the airport and I said, who owns your uh, scanning technology? And they said, what? And I said, well, you don't have a chief marketing op officer. There's, this is not a billboard. There's a logo on that scanning technology that you go through for x-rays because they own that infrastructure. It's a third party risk. Let's talk about that. Let's not talk about the drones. Other one for airports before I move on, DFW, where I live. I love Texas, come visit, love to meet you. Um, there is something called the Corporate Aviation Building at DFW, which is basically its own town, has its own zip code. And the corporate aviation building is where like Kim Kardashian flies in. And it's also where I take a puddle jumper, 10 seat plane to go to Harris, Arkansas, which happens to be an hour from my parents. So that's how I get home. And I get to this building and I'm like, what's your Wi-Fi password? And they said, we don't have. Well, first I got to the building and I went to the wrong side where the celebrities go and they're like, you're in, you're in the wrong place. Um, so I went to my side of the building for the puddle jumper for my $80 ticket. And then I said, what's your Wi-Fi password? And they said, we don't have, we don't have one. Um, and I was at a SCADA tech summit and I started talking to some of the leaders from DFW airport. And I told them that and they were like, what? I was like, great. So when you do these scenarios, there are things that we call low hanging fruit and they're not obvious, but they're also not Hollywood. So again, Chekhov's principle. Now, every time you think of an ICS scenario, every time you're speaking to a CISO, every time you hear from an expert, threats are real, threat actors are real. Purpose-built systems can be manipulated. We know that, but question the narrative for what keeps you up at night when there's fear, uncertainty and doubt involved. Okay, so I did promise that I did some research. Again, I wrote this paper, it was published on the 19th of April. And um, there's a great talk yesterday about standards and how it's so difficult. There's so many regulations and standards and there was a lot of consensus built around the themes that came out of that. I'm an analyst, Jason did a great job. There was one theme I know he knows that he didn't pull out. And that theme was tabletop exercises. Mike, great guy, gave an awesome talk about tabletops yesterday. Tabletops are essentially experiments. If you remember grade school science, experiments are testing hypotheses, and there's one rule about experiments. Does anyone know what the rule was? Repeatable. Experiments are supposed to be repeatable. So every single piece of legislation that's come out in the last couple of years has recommended a tabletop, and they say, do it however you want to do it, just do it. There's no standardization about how we choose the scenarios, how we exercise tabletops. Now, there's different ways to do it. There's tabletops and services, right? There's different principles that go into that. But across the board, there's no standardization. So that's what got me thinking about this little consensus problem. And so this has been, there's a dichotomy of this problem that in the government, it's assets versus functions. In tabletop exercises, it's focusing on a threat actor or focusing on targets as technology themselves. That's the same thing as the assets versus functions conversation. It's also split up as threats to versus threats from systems, right? Threat actors versus the actual vulnerabilities in the systems. Um, and there's a couple other ways that we break it down, but it really becomes siloed really quickly. And it's doing a disservice to how we think about working through these exercises and understanding what we're trying to learn and how we standardize those takeaways when we think about tabletops. So these are some of those high level issues that create little consensus when we start to use those dichotomies for understanding. Number one, plethora of existing product vulnerabilities and critical OT. 
the OEMs are doing better. They're doing their best, right? They do batch sampling. Um, they let us know when those vulnerabilities are discovered. They tell us how critical they are for that component, for that technology. And then it's our job to go and say, well, how I use this component, the way that it's configured, that's actually how vulnerable it is in my context. Very difficult to map, but very useful, right? But you could also spend $500,000, a million dollars, focusing on a bunch of vulnerabilities that don't actually statistically reduce your risk in your environment based on that context. That's not a great day, not a great scenario. Um, again, severity scoring, it's just too vague. It doesn't help you understand that context. It doesn't help you map or have any kind of purposeful security paradigms for how you use your budgets. Um, there's a loss of function outcomes and consequences. Back to Chekhov's principle. There are these big, scary vulnerabilities. These are really bad threat actors out there, and they don't help you say, in order to prevent this worst case scenario, you actually need to use an effects-based approach rather than a means-based approach. So you can't get too caught up in all the capabilities if you don't actually understand the effects. And that's what I mean about the function of the outcomes and consequences. They're not well scoped in terms of realistic scenarios that would lead to and produce cascading impacts. Think of that single point of failure, those common denominators across different sectors. And lastly, cyber impacts, um, physical processes are less repeatable. I think this one's been covered this week um, and it's, it's out there in a lot of open source materials. Um, it's not like IT, there's not a lot of copy and paste, right? There's a lot of purpose-built nature to the attacks, just like there's a purpose-built nature to all of your environments. So risks to cyber physical systems, again, I think this is pretty well covered. It's in the paper, we have legacy technologies, we could go secure all the technologies, that would be an asset specific thing. If we wanna keep the lights on, that's a function specific approach, right? Um, a lot of connectivity, a lot of known uh, materials out there. There's way too much known. That's how I was able to present that uh, Minuteman silo example to the government and they kept cutting me off and telling me I was gonna break my clearance and I didn't have one, right? I knew too much from the open source because if people wanna find information and it's out there, they'll find it. Um, Insecure remote co connections, lack of visibility. We've talked about that. Just in time supply chains, especially in manufacturing and human error. So then um, I wanna talk about something that hasn't been mentioned in the last two days. And that is really purposeful and intentional attacks on cyber physical systems. That's terrorism. We, we get that, right? Like everyone kind of knows that that's terrorism, but unfortunately there's like 150 definitions of terrorism. And actually Jake, I think is here, Brodsky, who runs this, this back channel um, uh, SCADA email listserv. And recently they were talking about how do we define an OT or ICS cyber incident specifically, one that targets cyber physical systems for, for an impact. And in my paper, I categorize these four boxes. You have an adversary, they have an intention, they meet those objectives within scope. You have an adversary, they have an intention, they accidentally or intentionally mission creep, they go out of scope. Maybe there are unintended consequences. You have uh, an operator, they have an intentional insider threat kind of scenario. And you have an operator and they have an accident. And a lot of coverage goes to the adversary intent. Not a lot of coverage goes to the operator accident. The majority of what we see, again, I work for a monitoring and detection company, see a lot of incidents. They are operator accident 90% of the time. And that's not, again, to dissuade from those threat actor scenarios. That's not to make fun of anyone who's worried about a real world example that could happen. It's just to talk about how we begin to prioritize what we focus on over the next five, 10, 15 years. Um, and so back to that kind of function versus asset dichotomy, if you read back years and years ago, there's a couple of books on this, and I think um, it's been covered in SANS materials really well, and that's looking at manipulation of view and manipulation of control, and um, what that means for how we build better definitions of cyber physical attacks. And so that's covered here as well, but does it have to be intentional? Does it have to be an accident to be a cyber physical attack? Do we get to know the intention of actors? Um, do we fire operators for accidents? I mean, this is a really slippery slope and it's not really beneficial. Um, so we have needle in the haystack problems. This is something that we talk about in Nozomi. It's something you talk about at other uh, uh, solution providers. If you have non copy and paste level attacks, then you're constantly searching for a needle in the haystack. You know what else you're doing? You're waiting for somebody else to be a victim before you. And that sucks whether it's in your sector, whether it's in another sector, whether it's in an ISAC community where you're sharing information, you are hoping and praying in Texas that something happens in Nebraska, you get the TTPs, you get the signatures, you pipe it into your detection program and you take a deep breath. That's not proactive security and it doesn't serve any industry. So I did promise that, you know, Chekhov's principle, if you have a gun hanging on the wall, you better use the gun. If you scare me with fear, uncertainty and doubt, you better tell me exactly how 
it's going to impact my facility, my process, my city, my pipeline, all of those things. I need to know the how, not the one and the why, I need to know the how. And so I started to develop a prioritization scheme that did two things. Number one, it helped to choose the right tabletop scenario that is repeatable so that you could actually maybe compare a water facility in Nebraska to a hospital in New York, to um, a, tree, a, a, a pharmaceutical manufacturing plant in California, to a dam, to a prison, to a school. There's no way to do that today and there's no way to prioritize that. So if you're a mayor with a budget, if you're a sector risk management agency, there's just no way to prioritize. So I started thinking about that. And then I started to think about a standardized score for how we would do that. So I built this methodology. Again, not a mathematician. The math is very, very simple. It's meant to be repeatable. It's meant to help you choose the right scenario. So here are the steps. You pick six scenarios and you have, spoiler alert, cyber experts in the room to help you with those scenarios. Pretty fundamentally, ransomware is gonna be one scenario. Um, you choose three that are a potential manipulation of view and you choose three that are a potential manipulation of control. Those need to be mutually exclusive, right? So the six scenarios have to be different, but they don't have to be OT intentional scenarios. So think colonial, you know, um, out of an abundance of caution, it did shut down the OT process, but it wasn't an OT directed attack, but that could be separate from, you know, a, a ransomware situation that was OT directed or something like that. So again, you can get creative with this. This is a creative process, it's iterative. You wanna use all of the brains you have in the room to do this. Then you score those based on cyber, okay? Uh, a gentleman yesterday asked a question in the audience about likelihood. And he said, you know what? We kind of abandoned likelihood calculations because they're subjective. Another spoiler alert, all risk register activities in cybersecurity are subjective. They are quantitative and qualitative and it's a marriage and it's imperfect. But if you can repeat imperfection, you can actually start to do comparative analysis. Um, and so, you wanna score the actual scenario based on cyber implications, what that means for the technologies that are targeted. And we're really good at doing that actually. And that's where likelihood data comes from. The problem is over the last five, 10 years, that likelihood calculation has moved away from the likelihood that a threat actor will be successful with known TTPs in your environment to the likelihood of being the next target. That's not the same thing, right? Nobody can produce the likelihood of you being the next target or the likelihood of you being targeted. They can tell you what's out there from a risk perspective and the things you can do to be statistically less of a low hanging fruit kind of target based on opportunistic tactics. But again, not the same as telling you how likely it is that you will be targeted. So we've manipulated that understanding. And it's again, it's not serving the industry. So then that's just cyber scoring, right? That's understanding again, the impacts, the technologies that I own and operate still not a great way to do scenario planning because you're too focused on the technology and you're not focused on the implications of the location, the people, your personnel, the environment, all those other things that are the mission set, that are why we're here. So I decided to weight and rank that based on um, some statistical data from terrorism. Again, 150 different definitions, tons of work that goes into terrorism anal uh, analysis. Um, the big one that people always used to talk about was Cyber 9-11. It's a horrible analogy because it is a skewed data point. So people focus on the number of fatalities. Horrible day, I'm a New Yorker. Like, again, should not be belittled as a scenario. It was a horrible day. But for Cyber 11 examples and analogies, everyone forgets the box cutter. Nobody does the analogy of the box cutter. They always focus on the casualties. And if you were to do terrorism analysis, you would actually have to pull that out of your data set because it skews it so dramatically that it's not useful. So how do we think about that for OT risks? So I decided to start weighing and rank these scenarios based on their ability to cause public panic and their ability to overwhelm local resources. A hospital in a rural area is actually gonna have a way worse day with ransomware than Atlanta did, even though it was a bad day. People didn't really panic. I mean, systems were offline and it was a long time to get them back up and running, but they had a lot of local support. It doesn't look the same. Um, and then finally, there's a standardized priority score, like I mentioned. So we put this to the test and we did have all cybersecurity experts in the room, but we only had an hour and a half to go through the methodology. And um, if there are any Mr. Robot fans in the room, there's an episode of Mr. Robot that looks at prison cybersecurity and they look at the PLCs that operate the doors that open and close for the prison. Um, they're typically like X amount of doors per PLC operating those facilities. Um, and there's a DEF CON talk you can look up on YouTube called like the Nightmare of Christmas Eve or something. And Mr. Robot actually took that DEF CON talk for their episode in this. 
And basically they do both manipulation of view and manipulation of control. And so if you go and watch this YouTube video, they manipulate the PLCs to where the operator thinks there's a, a light that blinks and that the operator thinks I have control over the system and the doors are closed. And in the background, not only are the doors open, but they're also still producing for the operator, the blinking lights to tell the operator that the doors are closed. Nightmare scenario, right? Um, prisons are near and dear to my heart because my dad was a prison counselor in upstate New York. So when we did this tabletop exercise, we did a mock prison example. And I actually used all the characteristics of the prison where I grew up visiting my dad at work in upstate New York, a supermax prison facility, not considered critical infrastructure, a couple of miles from an elementary school, quite a few miles from a hospital. These are the kinds of considerations for cascading impacts and fallout analysis that you don't typically see across tabletop exercises when you choose a scenario. So when we were looking at these scenarios, we were saying, well, there's the Mr. Robot scenario. And we actually had one of the women from that research and from that DEF CON talk come in and talk to us about all the access vectors. There were like USBs on cars that patrolled outside that um, neighbors were hacking into. And they were actually piping the feeds from the cameras on the prison property to YouTube. Um, there's commissary, there's tons of third parties, there's food, these are small cities, right? And they're, they have to outsource everything, uh, medical, transport, all of these different access vectors. And so immediately everyone thought worst case scenario is somebody takes over the controls for the doors and they let all the prisoners out, like happened on Mr. Robot. And when we worked through this methodology, um, we scored based on the colorful uh, graph over here and we gave that a 50, right? That's a bad day. It's a high score uh, in terms of technology. And the severity indicators that we use to score the table on the right are the questions you cannot read from your seats on the left. Um, but that's basically how we determine these scores. It's not how we determine the scenarios. You start with the scenarios and then you wind and, and, and whittle down from those scenarios based on the severity. But then you don't stop with severity. You wanna consider the fallout. So we took those scenarios based on their cyber severity and we weighed them again by the potential to overwhelm local resource capacity and the potential to cause public panic. A prison scenario in which all communications are shut off to the prison would cause much more panic than um, just somebody manipulating the doors because that would not essentially overwhelm local response capacity. It's something that people train for actually a lot more than communications being cut off. So we determined based on this methodology that the exercise that this prison really should prepare for is total communications blackout because it does impact way more parts of their business, parts of their risk metric, parts of their insurance, parts of their employment, parts of their scheduling, parts of their food delivery, all of these components for operations that they would not have considered had they run a tabletop exercise solely focusing on whether or not somebody could manipulate the view and control of the doors, even though the PLCs for that are you know, in Iraq in the back and they're not in the central operating center. So this is how we developed this. Um, I can talk a little bit more about the math. These were the different scenarios we also looked at. Uh, camera systems, access, scheduling and operational logistics, ransomware, of course third-party takeover, communications in a distributed denial of service, and third-party access to just the doors themselves. Again, that's the Mr. Robot um, example. Uh, a little bit more on the math. So this is the waiting. So you could do this for either or. So you could wait and focus on just the scenarios that might produce public panic. You could focus on just the scenarios that would theoretically overwhelm local resource capability. And then you could focus on both. Again, very simple math, but very high level use cases to start to do prioritization. So why does this matter for um, critical infrastructure? If I am a mayor, again, or a sector risk management agency, I have limited bandwidth, limited resource capacity and limited cybersecurity experts at my disposal. And so if I operate a bunch of critical infrastructure and I came to a, a place like this and a summit like this, and I listened to all of these brilliant folks, I would go back to my town or my sector or my, you know, my jurisdiction and say, legacy systems, native functionality. We have to focus on keeping the lights on, keeping the water running. And that's totally true. But you also have to focus on schools, hospitals, prisons, um, and how those, you know, legacy infrastructures do connect and communicate with the other parts of society that really do drive the mission that we talk about in this field. So this formula, again, is a very low you know, math, uh, high impact to do prioritization. And so the prison scenario that we ran through, 
here's the, the math for that, but it just takes the weighted totals and divides them by the sum of the severity score. So the severity score would change for every single scenario, for every single uh, location, facility. Mark mentioned yesterday, he does it by substation, which one's the most critical. You could do it that way. You could do all prisons in one state. There's a single state in the United States that has the most, they are private. Um, that means that they have commercial interests and could manipulate some part of the local economy or, or something even broader. But again, this is the only way that you could compare across sectors, entities that do completely different things, even if they use similar vendor technologies with similar known vulnerabilities, you would actually be able to understand the impact and the follow analysis based on cyber scenarios that are realistic that you can exercise to. And then you can also exercise to failure when you're planning. So you're not just planning to meet your plan that you said was your plan because it scares you. Um, so that's really all I have for this methodology. Like I mentioned, it was published by the Atlantic Council. Um, I've gotten some initial interest, ironically, from one sector, the, the water sector. So the water ISAC in the US wants to start to do this with their asset owners. And the similar water ISAC from the Netherlands also wants to use this approach because it's high level enough, but then it does get down to this standardized score that you can start to compare. And then eventually maybe you could take the top 10% of your at-risk facilities, locations, and entities and say, in the next five years with X amount of dollars, we're gonna focus on these facilities, locations, and entities because we are able to prioritize them across verticals. So any questions? 